Welcome back to Three Men in a Mystery. I'm John Lorton. I'm Mike Morford. And I'm Gray Hughes. This is episode seven of season two, Silenced the Death of Elisa Gomez. We've spoken a lot about Bradley Alexander over the past episodes. We had Judy talk about him in her interview. Uh, Elisa's sister Angie referred to him in her interview as well. Today, Bradley Alexander is going to get to speak for himself as we review the detectives interviewing him on the day that Elisa is discovered dead. Now we're going to present as much of this interview as we can. Uh, the audio quality is a bit better than the detective interview we had with Sharon. I did do just a little bit of light editing on parts of the interview that aren't directly related to the case. And you know, at certain times they're filling out paperwork and doing tests and stuff like that. Uh, but other than that, you're going to get to hear the whole thing. There are a few times where I'm finding it hard to understand what he's saying, but we're going to leave those in there so you guys can help us with that. And um, We'll all work through this together. So let's listen as Sergeant Twyla Valella begins her interview with Bradley Alexander. Sergeant Valella, today's date is 10 11, 2016. The time is 10 28 hours. I am interviewing, is it Bradley Alexander? Yes. Okay. And Bradley, what is your middle name? James. Spell your last name, please. A L E X A N D E R. And who have you been living here with? Uh, my fiance up until yesterday. Now my wife. And what is your what is her name? Elisa Ann Gomez. Okay. And how old is Elisa? Forty seven. Forty seven. And who else lives at this house with you? Her friend Sharon, roommate. And then she was renting out another room to Jake. Uh, was Jake here yesterday? Sharon said that he moved out. Okay. When's the last time you seen Jake? A few days. A few days. Okay. So he wasn't around yesterday at all. Nope. Did you have to see yesterday? Sorry, no. Okay. So Sharon lives <clears throat> here. Um, and where does she live in the house? Upstairs. Okay. And where? And where do you live? Um, we used to stay, stay down in the basement. Basement, that was your bedroom down there? Okay. And how long have you been uh, boyfriend girlfriend with Lisa? Since August 26th. Of this year? Mm-hmm. Okay, and then you were married yesterday? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And, and what is your relationship? What's it been like? Um, Pretty awesome, actually. Besides two weekends. <laughs> what 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 happened to make it not awesome? Um, one weekend we were arguing, and she went to the bar and brought some guy home. So, <laughs> <clears throat> and what weekend was that? Not this last weekend, but the one before. Okay, do you know who came over with it? Some stuff, guy. Okay. Were you home when that happened? Did you have a confrontation then? Not really a confrontation, but I was, you know, I made it aware that I wasn't happy. <laughs> she was blackout drunk and... So it wasn't this past weekend with the weekend before? Okay. And then it's not like I'm really snitching her out, but yeah, she left her Jeep two blocks down. She got impounded. And I guess she went to the bar and found him and anyways that led up to this last weekend. What happened this last weekend? I was I was still mad that that guy came over. <laughs> yeah. Everybody would be. I found him at Northbound and had an altercation with him. And Is that a bar? Okay. I was gone for two days and pretty much he's been really mad at me. So you had an altercation with the guy? Mm-hmm. And what, what kind of altercation? Was he in a fist fight or was it just verbal? Just verbal. Okay. Do you know what his name is? Seth. Seth. Okay. So you confronted him. Did Elisa know that? 
she was there about that? I guess. <laughs> okay. So did you go home that weekend? I came home on Sunday. Sunday? Okay. Did you come home or did she have to come and find you or? She came to pick me up. Okay. Where were you at staying? Um, I was hanging out with some friends and wasn't really that good of a situation. So I just left my stuff with them and had her pick me up so I'd get away from it. Okay. So when she picks you up, any argument down or anything? No. No? Pretty much begged for forgiveness. And you begged for forgiveness? Yes. Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but I think it's kind of interesting that we have um, begging for forgiveness coming off a bunch of stuff that he's upset about her doing. And then we've got them having these, uh, pr it's pretty awesome except for these two weekends, but these are the two weekends leading up to when they decide to get married. Uh, a mm. lot of strangeness going on here. I also did ask Judy if there was anyone named Seth in Elisa's life. And there is, there's a man named Seth who's actually uh, the husband of one of Elisa's close friends. So this whole story uh, about him, about her bringing some guy home, a guy named Seth, that could have been just a friend from what I understand uh, from Judy. And I guess there is the possibility that we're not talking about the same Seth. She seems pretty adamant that Seth would never be at a bar. I do. Uh, I did look up Northbound. I did see that it's kind of a, it's, it's a, like a beer pub, but also a restaurant. So I guess it could be feasible that Seth was there, you know, just to get something to eat or something. Um, but yeah. And the story about Elisa leaving the car and it being impounded, um, Judy feels very strongly that it was probably Brad that actually left the car. Um, she was receiving Elisa's email, uh, mail after Elisa passed away and she was getting constant notices of driving or parking infractions in particular. Um, that Brad was doing after Elisa's death. So kind of hard to know what to believe there. But um, what do you guys think about the tone of this conversation and how it's going so far? Keep in mind, we're talking about the woman you married about 12 hours before. I guess it's a little more at this point, but within the past 24 hours. And there, there just seems to be kind of an accusatory tone that I'm hearing in all this. What do you think? Well, it doesn't sound broken up about her being gone that's for sure um and every once in a while it, it may just be because he's nervous naturally nervous but there's a little snicker yeah after some of the stuff that he says and maybe it's just a nervous habit but um you know it's hard to without ever talking to him myself it's hard for me to judge if it sounds like he's being honest but he do definitely doesn't sound like he's emotionally uh uh broken up over his wife just dying yeah the part about uh, when he said that's what led up to last weekend. It seems like he was about to, you know, accidentally, you know, like in his mind, he there was something else he was thinking about. And then he realized, oh, wait, wait. And then he tried to spin it around and turn it on to Elisa. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also curious about this comment that she was blackout drunk because according to her family, I mean, yeah, she liked to she liked to have alcohol. And we know that her BAC was you know, it was certainly elevated. She was, she was having a good time on the night that she died, supposedly. I mean, we have footage of them going to the bar together. Um, but even according to what Sharon said, Elisa wasn't uh, necessarily a hard drinker. If I remember right, Sharon said that she drank more around the conflicts that Elisa was having with her boyfriend at the time. Um, but yeah, some pretty strong statements coming from him that just seemed to really be pointing a finger at her um, that is just, it, it really bothers me in terms of the timing of this. I just, I can't imagine having this type of conversation with someone about my wife, uh, yeah. the, the day yeah. that she dies. It just, it doesn't, there's no way. And he's opening himself up for, you know, if, if it was a murder, he's giving himself a motive. He's saying that he's upset about this guy and, um, how it bothered him. Very good point. Very good point. Um, so we go from Elisa bringing men home, being a blackout drunk that leaves her car in places, and Brad, for some reason, begging for her forgiveness when he flees a situation that he considers to be a not very good situation. And then them getting married after only 45 days of them being together. 
It seems like even Sergeant Valella is having trouble understanding all this. And then, then what happens? Well, how do you guys decide to get married? How does, how does this come about? And that's kind of crazy. Did you have yesterday in mind to get married, or was it just kind of spontaneous? Well, she had uh, an appointment to get the marriage license a while ago for Monday. <clears throat> And then we went there and they said it was only good for six months. And our wedding was supposed to be April 22nd. So it would have been inspired by then. And we just decided to do it. So yesterday you went and picked up the marriage license. And then said, oh, let's just do it now. So you, you said at Hennepin County where you got married? What judge married you? Uh, I'm not even sure. Of that. Paperworks in the Jeep, I believe. Okay. okay. So, but a judge married you then, okay? And what time was that about? 5.30. And then what did you do afterwards? Uh, brought her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend to their house in St. Louis Park, and I helped him look at his car because he was hurt. <laughs> so was the daughter a witness at your wedding? What's her daughter's name? Jade. Kate. What's her last name? Gomez. Okay. And what's her boyfriend's name? Uh, Isaac, I believe. Isaac. Do you know his last name? Okay. So you dropped them off in St. Louis Park? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, then where did he go? Then we went to... I'm not picking up the story, I just... I know. They're upset. I know. I understand. So take your time. It's okay. We had to go let uh, a couple of dogs out off of 41st and 38th. Because we do pet sitting and dog walking. Okay. And then we went out to eat at, I believe it's called the Victorian or something. Where's that at? Uh, Hennepin and Lake Street. Okay. Went there to celebrate our wedding. Okay. And we came back here, and Sharon had said something about her dad was just found dead, and she was drinking. So we went to the bar with her. This part right here? Yeah. Or what is that one called? Cedar Inn. Cedar Inn. So Sharon was already drinking. And then you guys went to drink, have some drinks there? Yes. Okay. How many drinks do you think you had? Uh, we had, a, I believe, a bottle of champagne. A bottle of champagne, okay. Right. Three each. And then they had little bottles. They sent four of us home, or four of them. Okay. So the bottle of champagne was it a big bottle or one of those smaller ones? Uh, I think the one that we drank there was out of the big one. Okay. Then they sent you home. The four little ones. Four little ones. What time do you think you got home at? What time do you think you were at the bar at? I guess like around 11. 11? Not for sure, though. It was actually 11.17 when they arrive at Cedar Inn, and they are there until about... A uh, quarter to one based on the security cam footage that we've looked at. Uh, a couple things that I noticed during that. First of all, he's talking about the appointment for their marriage license and that it wouldn't have um, been good long enough for their planned wedding date of April and that they decide when they're there that they're going to go ahead and get married. Um, I've seen pictures of them at the actual courthouse she is made up like a bride. So it, it doesn't make sense to me that that was a snap decision that happened when they were at the courthouse. And I've gone looking at the websites for even where you book the appointments for that stuff. There is big, obvious postings all over those websites that marriage licenses are only good for six months. 
uh, I just, I really am having trouble with this aspect of the story. I don't know why you would lie about it necessarily. Um, but there's something about this that is wrong because it's, it's not fitting yeah. with what I'm seeing. I mean, I've, I've seen the pictures, man. She was getting ready for a wedding. Her makeup was completely done up. She had her dress. She had stuff in her hair. She was clearly there for a wedding. Um, so I don't know why he'd be lying about that. He might be, he might be trying to make it seem like, you know, be, if this does seem like a really rushed wedding and he's trying to paint it as something that's been going on, even though that right there made it seem like it was rushed, like spur of the moment. But he said in there that she had filled the paperwork out a while ago, right? Did you hear that part? It was strange because that means, I mean, she filled it. How long ago was that? Because they, how long, they only knew each other for a couple months, right? Yeah, not even. I mean, I mean So she's going to file papers like a weekend? And, you know, well, just, the process actually, if you go to the website, and this actually might even prove that she did go to the website. If you go there, it's very clear that there's paperwork that you need to bring with you, and it'll help expedite things. And you can print out the forms before you go and fill all that stuff out. Uh, so once again, that's pointing to she probably went to that website. And I'm telling you guys, it's right at the top. I mean, it's like <laughs> they make yeah. it as obvious as possible. This license is only good for six months. Um, and of course, I didn't look at the paperwork, but I would be very surprised if it's not on the paperwork as well. But I know that it's all over the website. Um, and also, do you, do you remember? Uh, I didn't remember seeing them carrying any bottles home. Yeah. In remember um, in the video when she's leaving? there is like a little pack that she's taking with her. And I believe that is four small champagne bottles. Okay. So, um, Elisa took it. Not yes. The, okay. Not, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And in that footage, um, it, it just, it looks like she's upset when she's leaving. She's kind of huffing out. Brad and Sharon are behind her. She goes walking past two guys that are smoking outside and she's basically completely ignoring them as she shoots by Brad and Sharon follow out a moment later and it's like, it kind of looks to me like they're looking for her and they actually stop and talk to those two guys. And I think the, the guys are kind of like, yeah, we saw her. She just walked off that way. Um, so just, just strange. I don't know what's happened, but there seems to be some disagreement that has started at Cedar Inn. Uh, also, just to ask the public to potentially help. There's some areas around where he's talking about the dog walking where I don't know exactly what he's saying. Um, so if you guys are listening to that and you're hearing something, please tell us about that in the comments on the YouTube video or contact us um, through the email. Also, when he talks about where they went to dinner, I can't make out that restaurant name. And I've looked at that corner. Um, I, I can't find whatever restaurant he's referring to there. So if you guys can help us with that, uh, please do more. If anything else that you noticed about this. Yeah, I, um, you know, if it was Jade that was the witness, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure the detective cleared with her, followed up with her that what he's saying is true, right? Well, I mean, she's the witness for the wedding ceremony. Yeah, but for the actual, not at the at the courthouse that we're talking, right? Yes. Yeah, she's at the courthouse, and her signature is on the on the marriage. So, so she would be the one to know, possibly whether it was planned or not, whether to. to shoot holes in, in Brad's story or that's um, a very good point. That's a very good point. And, uh, I can definitely get a question to her on that. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. There was, there was something else that I noticed. He said when there was, they were pausing, uh, when he was pausing, thinking about it, he did say, I'm not making up a, a story. And then she said, Oh yeah, you're just nervous. Right. But like, <laughs> why would that be in his head right there? You see? Yeah. That's a strange thing to even say, out loud because you should just be going yeah and then go on with your story instead of thinking i'm not making this up well that now i'm thinking you are making it up that's it you know? that's a good point because i think most investigators would probably when they hear that maybe that sets off an alarm that hey this guy is making up a story yeah maybe you'd let and him hang out there a little bit and see where he goes with that pause start asking some tougher questions or, or whatever to try and trip him up to see or, if he is. You know, or respond with, uh, well, I'm not sure yet. You know, like he, right. she should, she could have got him a little bit more nervous feeling at that moment, but maybe she wanted to hear what he was going to say. Well, and I do think there's something to be said about different approaches for a questioning like this. Um, 
you know, I mean, I think everyone has heard of good cop, bad cop, but I think you can think of different approaches like that too. Like I'm going to try to make this person feel like I'm on their side, I'm their friend, I'm helping them through this. And maybe that's one avenue to get them to talk. Then you've got different approaches where it's a bit more confrontational. And this isn't an interrogation. This is really an interview, uh, just you know, trying to get the initial information out. There's maybe two moments in this whole tape where I feel like, oh, it sounds like he's getting possibly a little emotional there. And we already played the first one. It was in the very first clip when he's saying Elisa's name. Sounds like he kind of breathes in in a, in a bit of a, a way where you know maybe he's choking down some tears or fighting something back. Um, there's another one that's coming up, but it's not a lot, guys. I mean, I got to tell you, I'd, I'd be a mess having a conversation like this. And I just. I thought uh, that pause was more that he couldn't remember what her name was. And he was trying to, <laughs> you know, I, I, to actually I, think of, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And then he remembered and he says yeah. it. It's right. strange you say that, Greg, because I do feel like uh, he's got some recall issues with some of the information that's going on here. Uh, on his on her last name, I thought he paused quite a bit, like he was thinking about what her last name was. Right, right. Let's go ahead and continue with Sergeant Valella as she asks Brad if there was any argument at the bar, something we've been wondering for a long time. Were you arguing in the bar? No. Was there something going on that you guys were mad at each other after the wedding? Um, she does not want me to talk to her. She's so messed up. She didn't want me talking to the people that I was with ever again. On the past weekend? Okay. And they've been friends of mine for a really long time. So you guys didn't say an argument about that again? Yes. yes. Okay. And then you came home. Did you continue to argue about it? I guess the argument happened in the neighbor's yard. I don't really recall, but she, His neighbors are here. she just came over and said that my phone was in her yard and that a man and a woman were arguing out there, so I'm guessing that was us. <laughs> okay. And so you were seeing her today at the neighbor and she said that you guys were out there arguing? While I was sitting in the grass, she came over and said that to uh, the officers. Okay. Did you remember arguing out there? Mm, not so much in her yard, but I remember the context of the argument. Okay. And the argument was about your friends? Okay. Yes. Did you ever threaten to hurt her? No. No. Did she ever threaten to hurt you? No. Has she ever threatened to hurt you or herself? Herself. Never me. Okay. And when she, she would say she was going to hurt herself, okay, did you believe that she would do something like that? No. Not at all. <clears throat> she reassured me that she never would. Did she say how she would hurt herself? <clears throat> um, this last weekend while I was gone, supposedly she took a whole bottle of Advil. But it was just to try to get me to come home. So she really didn't take a bottle? No. And she called you and she told you that? Text message. It's on my phone. You can find me. You, you still have the text messages? For, yeah. Okay. For Where's your phone at? I don't know. Oh, over there. Okay. So it's still a text message to you. So she said, I took a whole bottle of Advil, and that's when you got in touch with her to pick you up? No, this was afterwards. Afterwards. So you're already home, and she texted you that information? I'm confused. No, she said that after I left. Okay. And then you came back. Day later. Day later. So <laughs> did you not believe that she took that until no, then? Is that why you didn't come home or call anyone? Yes, because uh, we were staying at one of her pet sick client's houses at Pentos downtown on the 27th floor, and she, another night, was drunk, threatening to jump off the rail, and... She wasn't going to jump off the rail, but she kept saying it. But, okay, when was that? A couple weeks ago. September? No, a couple of weeks ago. Okay. So where was that? I'm sorry, I don't know exactly. It's, um, right off uh, 9th in Chicago at Skyscape. 
So she is starting to jump up the 27th floor. Did you call anyone, ma'am? No, I told her that I called the cops so she could get away from the rail. And then she did. And then called the cops back. Well, I never called them, but she called them and said that I thought she fell over the rail. Or, oh. Did they ever come out of the police? No. Because she said she was okay. And you never called the police then to report it. I just told her that so she could get away from the rail. Um, so there's a couple things that grab me about this segment. The first one is him when he says, it's so messed up. She didn't want me talking to the people I was with ever again. When he says it's so messed up, it feels to me like he's referring to the argument he was having with Elisa about not talking to his friends, not about the fact that she just ended her own life supposedly in their bedroom. Did you guys pick up on that? Yeah, I, I did. I picked up on it. Um, I, you know, he, he definitely seemed like he wasn't saying it's messed up that she's dead. It seemed like she was. He was saying she, it's messed up that we had this argument about that. Yeah. yeah, that's what it feels like. That he's he's more upset. Like, man, she was trying to get me to not communicate with these friends that I've had for a long time. How dare her? Yeah. Now I can tell you, um, the family is very concerned that. What this issue was is actually those friends he was hanging out with might have been some type of drug connection. Uh, and we even have him saying this is a situation that wasn't a good situation for him. And, you know, he's begging Elisa to come and pick him up from this friend, supposedly. Um, I don't know if this is the same group of friends or what, but there seems to be something with uh, there's a circle of friends that Elisa does not want him being a part of. Um, so I, I think it, it could be related to potentially some, some drug use there. It, then we get is, in. I was going to say, don't you think it's strange that he doesn't realize that like, he doesn't remember where the argument happened. I guess it was in the neighbor's yard. Right. Yeah. Like, what? Well, like, what do you he mean? He doesn't you, remember you the fence it. ripped down. Uh, yeah. You, all, you, uh, you all across the grass. <laughs> you don't remember that, but you remember really clearly that the argument was about not being able to talk to your, the friends. That's a really good point. That's yeah. a really good point. He remembers the context of the argument better than where it's going down. Yeah. That must've been a heck of a bottle of champagne at Cedar Inn, huh? Um, then we get them talking about if Elisa is ever, ever threatened to hurt herself. And we hear these two stories and there's a very interesting line that he's writing with these stories. It's like he wants to convey, yes, she did talk about hurting herself, but it was never actually going to happen. Like he talks about the Advil thing and she clarifies, oh, so she really didn't take the bottle. And he says, no. And when they talk about the Chicago incident with the rail that she was going to supposedly jump off of, which, first of all, I have a big problem with. I was threatening to call the cops and that stopped her. I mean, really, you've got someone that's suicidal that's going to jump off the rail and you think calling the cops is enough to stop them. I just I, I don't know what the logic is there. Now, to, to, to play devil's advocate for a second. Yeah. The, the way I take it, if. If. If I was him and I, you know, I'm not saying he murdered his wife, but if I had and I wanted to make it look like a suicide, I'd be playing up the suicide thing. Oh, she tried to kill herself. He's almost dismissing it like it wasn't serious to me. That's, that's how I'm taking it is it wasn't serious. So he wasn't really that worried about it. Whereas I. If I was trying to make it look like it was a suicide, I would be saying, oh, luckily I saved her and, and kept her from doing it. She tried it a couple times before. I'd be playing it up. He doesn't seem like he is. That's the way I'm taking it. That's why I'm wondering if there's another condition that he's worried about. Because, for example, if he did have several indicators that were legitimate indicators of her being able to do this to herself and he didn't act on those, then perhaps the family could file a wrongful death suit. Hmm. Where, but it seems like he's, but he's definitely bringing it up. He keeps coming up with more stories, so he does want that angle out there that she's tried to uh, kill herself, and then he want, and then he said that he was, he was the one that was able to stop her. So right. it, it, it does seem like he is bringing it up that angle. Uh, if you look at it like that, like he keeps bringing up other instances. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really bizarre. I I just I don't know where to where to go with it. It does feel like he's 
promoting that information, but then it feels like he's discounting it at the same time. And I think it's just that that line that we're talking about that he um, he wants to make sure that they are aware that there was points where she was saying things that could lead to something like this, but there was really nothing he needed to do about it because that stuff wasn't real at the time. Yeah, and I think you just said it a minute ago. It is weird. Why would you call? Uh, hey, I called nine one one. You better not jump. Well, I mean, if you're jumping, you don't give a damn about nine one one. Yeah, what is that like going to do as a threat yeah. to the person? It that that just logically, yeah. I don't know how that works. And then there's this weird thing where this conversation feels like it starts degrading, like it just starts breaking down in the details. And he's talking about like you know she asks when was this? Oh, it was a couple of weeks ago. Oh, so September? No. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know exact dates. Well, this is October 11th, and then if that was a couple of weeks ago, guess what? It certainly was September. Not to mention, you've only known her for 45 days. Most of that was <laughs> September. So why is this? I just I don't know why this conversation is kind of breaking down the way it is by the end. Yeah, one thing I picked up on, and to me, it seemed like there wasn't enough follow up from the detective about some of those details. That's been consistent between these two interviews. I just feel like there's questions that are coming up and we're not pressing into those areas. Um, and we're going to definitely see that in one major way as this continues. Well, we'll continue with Brad's interview right after this quick break. A lot of us struggle with finding happiness, dealing with tough life issues, and so much more. But you don't have to struggle alone. And you don't even have to leave your home to get the help you need, thanks to BetterHelp Online Counseling. BetterHelp is available on desktop or mobile for both Android or iOS. You can speak to a counselor via text, chat, phone, or video. Find secure, convenient, professional help that's affordable with BetterHelp. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, but you can find licensed professional counselors that you can speak to from the comfort of your own home. Three Men and a Mystery listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code 3 men. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash three men. Financial aid is available to those who qualify. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash three men. Find help to break through those personal obstacles with BetterHelp. Welcome back. And please keep in mind that our sponsors are helping us raise funds that will go towards investigating this case further and honoring the life of Elisa Gomez. So please show them the same support they're showing us. One of the biggest holes in this case came up during Sharon's interview, and we're going to see Sergeant Valella take a similar approach with Bradley and have a similar result. How did the fight outside that warranted a 911 call actually end? So yesterday evening then or last night, you were arguing with her outside. Neighbor says you're arguing in the yard. You go back in the house and argue. Mm-hmm. I said, and actually talked to Sean most of the night with her boyfriend up on the couch while he was in the basement. Okay, Sean had a boyfriend here? Yes. Who's her boyfriend? Um, yeah, I'm not sure his name. <laughs> not sure his name? What do you look like? Um, Nothing. Um, <laughs> Off head? Uh, is he white, black, Asian? White. How old? Mm-hmm. I'd say late thirties. Hairstyle. Short. What color? Um, brown. Brown. Like a brown. Okay. Was he at the bar drinking with you guys too? Mm-hmm. No. So when you go in the house, where does Elisa go? She was in the basement. She went to the basement. Did you go down the basement at all? No, I found her this morning. Okay, did you go at Al last night? Absolutely. So, Sarone and her boyfriend, and you are in the living room talking then? Yes. Okay. And wh- where does Sarone and her boyfriend go? She ended up leaving, and then I fell asleep on the couch talking to her, and she went upstairs. Sure, went upstairs. Okay. Was her kids home? Yes. Okay. How old are her kids? 
I'm not sure that exactly. It's like three, four. Three and four. Okay. So, yeah. Who was watching her kids when you guys were at the bar? They were sleeping. They were sleeping. So no one was in the house at the night. Okay. So you come back. You guys have your conversation. Lisa goes downstairs. You never go downstairs to check on her. She never comes up. No, when I woke up, somebody that I didn't recognize left the house. Who, that male or female? Female. Okay. And like I was telling one of the officers last night, her and Sean were joking about them two getting together. So I thought maybe that was her girlfriend or somewhere. That's what she was doing down there. Okay. So I went down there to see what who that was and what that was about, and that's when I found her. Okay. So when you said you seen this female leaving the house, was she coming from the basement, or was she just in the living room? And she just walked in the living room. That's okay. what I woke up to. Okay. So it was turns she, out it was Sharon's sister or somebody taking one of her kids. I don't even know where to start with that one, um, except for that black hole in the conversation that we had with Sharon about not knowing what happens with the fight, how Elisa comes back into the house, despite the fact that she's sitting in there with Brad. So at some point she has to notice that Brad comes in because they're talking for hours into the night, uh, pops up in this interview again. And it feels, it just feels to me like he's running away from that aspect of the conversation and all of a sudden oh yep i was talking to sharon and her boyfriend was here and he's a meth head and he's you know all of a sudden we get off into that tangent and i see um sergeant valella actually try to pull him back to uh, how did elisa come back in what actually happened around that and as much information as he's willingly providing all of a sudden his demeanor changes like he gets very low and the information just goes to an extremely slow drip i'm really bothered by that because he's willingly providing so much more information and here it just seems like when we get to that that time frame of we know that you guys are fighting outside what happens when you come back in it's like there's a jump that's happening there it certainly makes me uncomfortable what do you guys think yeah i i the I was always curious what led him down the stairs the first place, um, and and now we know that it was Sharon's sister. Um, I would have liked the same thing we've been asking at your wedding night. How come you didn't spend the night together? I would have liked him that question asked. Now we haven't heard that, so maybe she asked that later on at some point. But up to this point, we haven't heard that. Um, but I would have liked to have heard his explanation. And the other thing that jumped out to me was leaving your, your three, four-year-old kids at home by themselves while you go to um, to drink. It's just, uh, I don't know. Yeah, and they're so, gone for about an hour and a half. Yeah, and trip. I don't care if it's if it's a uh, 100 feet away. I mean, if you've got three or four-year-old kids, you don't leave them in the house alone. You, you just don't do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was also weird when they asked him what the guy looked like. All he said was a meth head. Right. I mean, that's it. You know, it's, uh, it just seemed, it, it, I don't know, some of, some of his answers just seem so um, like intentionally vague. And then, then, you're, then you sort of press to, uh, I, I don't know, it's, it's some, something about the way he responds bothers me a lot. He had a nervous laugh during that response, too. Yeah, yeah. When, when he was asked the name, he went, huh, I remember, huh. Right. Um, I also think it's really interesting, this whole story about he thought that, uh, well, first of all, he says Elisa and Sharon were joking about them two getting together when they were at Cedar Inn. He calls it joking at that point. He doesn't say that they were talking to each other and that they were serious, or he doesn't say that this is something that has come up before. Uh, you know, he's, he specifically says they're joking, but in the morning he sees a woman coming through the house. And his first thought is what, that Elisa made a booty call at three in the morning and some woman snuck in the back of the house to be with her downstairs, knowing he wasn't going to come down. None of that story is logical. None of that makes sense. 
not not to mention the fact that um, this is Sharon's sister taking her kid to school. So is he seeing when she's actually leaving? Because she's leaving with the child. So how are you getting any of this wrong and thinking that has something to do with Elisa sleeping with a woman? Makes zero sense. I don't get it. You have to wonder if he was still drunk or hung over and just took that out of it or maybe on something else that uh his he was impaired somehow it does seem like there's a little bit of a jealousy aspect that i see that keeps kind of poking through here i mean even the story about this seth guy that she supposedly brought home now he's worried that she's going to be sleeping with a woman on the day that they get married by the way which if you are going to have relationships like that are you really going to hey let's go get married and then yeah i'm gonna you know i want to sleep with our roommate and i'm gonna invite someone else over it just I don't know. I don't know. And let's not lose sight of the fact we're talking about his wife that just ended her own life, supposedly from his perspective. I mean, how much harder can you be be bashing her character over and over and over? Yeah. She was cheating on me the first night. Right. Yeah. Right. So there was the Sharon's uh, sister the went here. down and found the body first. No, he just saw her coming through the house and he's saying he thought that this is a woman that was leaving Elisa's bedroom. And that's what prompted him to go downstairs. Okay. So he goes downstairs uh, and he saw her. And then he goes back upstairs and tells Sharon to go down there. Right. Yeah. On this next clip, we're going to get into the actual details of him finding Elisa. So then that's when you go down the basement. And what, and what do you see? Her facing the opposite direction of me, hanging from, I don't know what it was. Did you cut her down? No, Sharon did. Do you know what Sharon cut her down with? No clue, but freaked out and ran upstairs. And I get that. And I did not have my phone, so I couldn't call. Who called 911? She did. Sharon did. You know what she was hanging by? I mean, was it a belt, a scarf? Mm, it was like a, I don't know, some weird, like, purple cloth. That, did that purple cloth belong to her or you? Her. Okay. You're not familiar with that? Okay. Do you, did Sharon try to do CPR or anything like that? I don't know. You don't know? You left once you seen her. I when, went back downstairs again. Okay, so when you found <clears throat> Elisa, I ran upstairs, knocked on Sean's door, and said, Can you please come downstairs? Just you. And then what happens? You bring her down the basement? And yes, see her. Yes. Okay. And that's when Sean sees her as well. Okay. Is there anything else you want to tell me that I haven't asked you? Do you think Sharon would have hurt her? Definitely not. Okay. Do you think the meth boyfriend of hers would have hurt her? No. Did you hurt her? No. There's no doubt in my mind that she did it to herself. I just don't understand why. Do you think she did it for attention? No, it's not why you get attention. I don't think. Well, some people, unfortunately, think that's a way, but sometimes it falls too far. I don't know if she threatened it, but I mean, Do you know if she's ever tried this in the past? Has the kids ever said anything like that? No, for two months, I just fell in love with everybody. Okay. Well, I have a couple of questions for you then. Would you be willing to give us a consent to search your phone? Okay. And what this is, is it has someone in our can do whatever you want. take the phone I and dump it. And, this, so you can do whatever you want. And we can look for your text message that you talked about as well. Okay. So I'm going to pull this form off for you, Bradley. It really sucks, you know that? Yes, I, I, I'm sorry. I can't even imagine yeah. what you're going through. It sucks to hurt. And then for anybody to think that 
These are just questions we have to ask. We have to do a thorough investigation. You know, and I know it's offensive and stuff, some of the questions, but we wouldn't be doing our job and we wouldn't be doing her any justice if we can ask these, any, these questions. So this is basically saying that we are actually going to bring your phone down to the crime lab and we're going to recover all data from your phone, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is print your name and then sign your name. We'll see things you don't like on there, but... You know, they're not the first has phone. To do with this. They're not the first phone that would happen to, okay? So if you guys recall back to when we were speaking to Dr. Laura Petler, uh, she had these different indicators where uh, investigators should be cautious of it being a staged homicide. And one of those indicators was who makes the 911 call. And we kind of rated it as a half point because Brad runs upstairs and tells Sharon to make the 911 call. But here we get a very good reason why he couldn't make the call himself. His phone is basically sitting outside in the neighbor's bushes at this time. So considering that, we could, I think, even nudge that indicator a little bit closer. He could have very well have been the person to make the 911 call if he actually had his phone. Um, what would you guys think about that segment? Well, it, it, it seemed to, once it turned towards the real tough questions about um, cooperation and who do you think Sharon might have done anything to her, as soon as she asked the question you know, did you do anything to her? There's not a doubt in my mind that she did this to herself. It was like a, a big oversale uh, of that. Right. Like, don't even look at me. It wasn't me. And then he says, it sucks. You know, he starts to say, it sucks that, you know, you're, you're questioning me like this. Um, yeah. We yeah, could yeah. even write off the, uh, the meth boyfriend, right? You've got some random guy you call a meth head in your house, but yeah, there's no way he had anything to do with this. Oh, yeah. yeah, you don't know him from Adam. You can't. You don't know his first name. He's just some method, but he didn't do right. it. Right. Yeah, the part that part really bothered me. I wrote it down. He said, "This really sucks." And what he was really saying is, "It really sucks for me." But then he went, yeah. "Well, it it sucks for her." But and then he wanted to say what he really. But it also sucks for me that you're asking me these questions. See, that's what he was really saying. He was saying this sucks, and he was talking about how you are asking me these questions thinking that I had something to do with it. But then he realized he also has to say, he threw it in as an aside almost like, oh, I mean, it sucks for her too, but it really sucks for me because you guys are asking all these questions. Yep. That was ridiculous. Well, uh, Sergeant Valella talks about DNA testing. Brad opens up a little bit more about how they met, but he seems to have a very specific concern. All right. Now I would like to take a DNA buckle swab from you. Would you be willing to do that? Mm -hmm. Have you ever done anything like this? Given a DNA sample at all? Yeah, I've given one before. Okay. So you know it's harmless. How did you guys meet? Craigslist, actually. <laughs> Craigslist? Yeah. She bought her new Jeep and was offering rides, and I don't have a license, so it's not my phone there. So she's like, I bought a new vehicle, anyone want to go for a ride? Charge money to do it. Oh, charge money to do it, okay. So where's the Jeep at? In the back. So where do you work then? Do you work with her, or? No, yeah, we do Dog City. Okay. Does everybody go through this kind of stuff? Yes. We try to do everything that we can to prove or disprove something. So it's beneficial that you are cooperating and it's, you know, and we can prove things in certain situations that you did this. Right, because I did not. Have you had that much safety yet? the only good thing I've had in my life in a long time. You know, she also she was a super lady. They swam the inside of your mouth. Well, we did have sex on our wedding day, so I hope that doesn't come back against me. No. 
We did have sex on our wedding day, so I hope that doesn't come back against me. Why would you be worried about that necessarily? I I, I wouldn't even be thinking about that at that moment. No. I don't. I mean, I'd I'd be just so messed up over my wife dying that I wouldn't be thinking about to even say something like that. He seems but to get when, really nervous yeah. around this whole DNA thing. Like, just all of a sudden, he's starting and stopping his conversations. And it, does everyone have to go through this? And yeah, this DNA thing seems to be bothering him. Great. Yeah, and when when did they have sex that day? Was it like right after the courthouse or? I would love to know. Um, I actually started putting together a little bit of a. Um, time frame, a, a list of the order of events that he says happened. And I don't know when uh, this could have happened. I mean, basically he says they go and get married. That happens around 530 in the afternoon. Uh, they go from that to taking Jade and her boyfriend back to their house. And there, uh, it seems like he stays for a while because he's helping Jade's boyfriend with his car. Uh, Isaac's car. Then they do whatever that pet sitting trip is that happens at 41st and 38th. I don't know if that's, I think it was, he might be saying it's a dog walk. I think that they're doing at that time. Then he talks about them going to eat at the restaurant that I can't make out. That's at Lake and Hennepin. And then they come home after that. So I would assume, I mean, he could have been, they could have been having that dinner as late as like 7.30 or 8, according to what I'm seeing here, and accounting for some travel between all these different locations. Uh, maybe before they went to the Cedar Inn, that's really the only time frame I'm seeing there, unless they're talking about earlier in the day before they even went to the courthouse. But, I mean, nowadays, you don't need to be married. It's not like any of that is any makes any sense. I think that you would... Uh, it, it made it sound like he was stressing the wedding day. Yeah. yeah like that's yeah. a like, reason. Hey, we're, we're official. We were already married. We're official. Like it was consummated. Like, uh, you, you know, where mm -hmm. he's trying to stress that as if, um, again, playing devil's advocate, if, if somebody was trying to get something or say that they're entitled to something, you know, we consummated this marriage. It's, it's, it's official. Um, it, it felt like he was saying that. There's one other thing. I don't know if you guys picked up on it, but um, in the part where he said, I've lost the only good thing I've had in my life in, in a long time, he he started to say something else. And I, yeah. I, 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 I think it might have been, I didn't. I don't know what he's going to say. I heard that too. Yeah. Like, I did, I don't know what he's going to say, and I, I can only imagine, but it, to me, it sounded like I didn't do this. I didn't have anything to do with it. Right. It felt like it was going to go in that direction, and then he just stopped himself and said that instead. Well, I had something. I, I was actually had that one as one of my comments too, but not about that specifically. It was more like, out of all the things that he said, that the only thing that I can believe is true is that actual sentence there. You know, it seems like um, I've lost the only good thing I've had in my life. <laughs> she yeah. was a good thing, right? So it's like, yeah, that's a good thing. Now, whether or not he actually feels that way or not, uh, we don't know. But that statement, uh, she was a good person. So, Well, that's kind of interesting because according to the rest of this interview, um, I don't know that he does feel that. Because he's talking about how awful she was and she's bringing other men home and he thinks she's sleeping with women and this yeah. and that. I just, it's it's a really strange comment, not to mention the fact that they're together for 45 days by the time this is happening. I'm really caught on him being freaked out and trying to make some reasoning for them finding his DNA on her. And I'll tell you what bothers me about it, guys, is you've seen the photos of how she's found. She's essentially fully clothed, except her pants are off. And if we think about this situation where uh, we know in the video at Cedar Inn what she's wearing, um, unfortunately, that video is not in color, so we can't tell if it's an exact match for what is found on the top of her. Uh, but it looks to be a, a reasonable match for that. They go home. They have their argument. They're fighting outside. I'm assuming she has her pants on while they're fighting outside. And then we hit this black hole of not knowing how she comes back inside, what anyone says to her, what she does. Just all of a sudden, they're talking in the living room. 
And she goes down deciding to end her own life. If we assume what they're saying is true and takes her pants off, but doesn't get the rest of her clothing off. Like if she's getting ready for bed while she's upset and then she decides to do this or something. I just, I'm, uh, it's, I'm bothered by those two pieces. Uh, cause the pants already seems like it's a weird inconsistency in this story and him being very clear that he needs to make an explanation for why his DNA might be found on her. So maybe forced sex that night and it's in his subconscious. So then he's really trying to say, Hey, it was our wedding night. And that's why there'd be sex, uh, something and, like that. And I'll throw a third condition in on this. We have a previous victim of his that came up in that city pages article we covered back on the first episode talking about the fact that they got in a fight i think it was around three o'clock in the morning where he winds up actually choking her trying to force sex on her hmm. that's 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 the, if it was just a something else just some kind of other argument but those specific details just matching up so well it's, it's very powerful it's hard to hard to ignore that yeah yeah, it just it really really bothers me. Uh, we've and I, I I wish just to follow up on the one thing we were just talking about too. I wish the uh, detective asked, "When did you have sex? What time was it?" Yes, because if he wasn't on his game and he was lying, she might have been able to catch him in a lie of, "Oh, it was right when we came home from the bar." Because then she could have turned around and said, "Wait a minute, you told me that when you came home from the bar, this or that," or if he just explained it was first thing in the morning you know, that day, then it wouldn't be as big a deal. So I, I wish she had asked that question just to see what he would have said. Well, it might've been a big thing if he said that it was the first thing in the morning, because that's when Elisa was not alive anymore. Well, no, I meant first thing that morning, the oh, day I of see. the wedding, yeah. the day before okay. 24 hours early, essentially. Right. But she, we, we don't know. Cause she didn't ask that question. So we don't know what time they had sex. Yeah. 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 And, um, I, I just to ask you guys real quick, do you feel like there's any, moments in this interview where she's really trying to press into those areas and catch him in a lie just no a, a couple of times she tried to get clarification but it really didn't seem like she was really focused in on trying to really figure out what happened does it feel to you like she's just kind of taking things at face value i i to me, it's just as if I didn't know anything about the case and you sat me down to listen to that, it would just sound like an investigator checking off some boxes of some questions they have to ask and then moving on. I think that's exactly um, how the family feels. I think that's what they're worried about. And I think Angie even said that at the end of her interview that, you know, um, she doesn't want an apology necessarily, just an acknowledgement that maybe they didn't approach this as strong as they could and investigate it as strong as they and, could. And, and, and again, I'm not bashing you know, law enforcement, because, you know, I'm a big supporter of law enforcement. Not everybody's perfect, but maybe later on they find out, they look at him and say, Oh, he's got this checkered past. He's got this and that. Let's talk to him again. Yeah. Maybe question them again a little bit harder, ask him some more direct questions. If that doesn't happen, why not? Why doesn't that happen? That's a really good point. Mark. This, this, this is one conversation in what was probably most likely a series of, of conversations. Um, hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe they did take all this at face value, and that was that, and close the book. But we know that uh, if nothing else, they have decided to do a little more testing and some more interviews recently. So um, maybe they'll push into that a little more. I truly believe that Sergeant Valella is sensing that black hole that I keep referring to in this series. Um, she tries even once again to try to get some better detail. Let's go ahead and listen to that. Did, did she seem really upset last night when she went to bed? I, I so kind of unreasonable. I think that's probably why Sharon was talking to me all night. I don't know. I don't want to say anything bad about her because I love her, but she really just wanted me and not the people that I was saying no. It was kind of hard for me to just want to throw away because I've known him forever. And she didn't like the idea. Was it that influence, though? Because she probably was just trying to get me to I get that it's hard to throw friendships away, but when they're not healthy, sometimes it is hell. And I made that promise to her. That's why we got married yesterday. <laughs> 
Uh, he doesn't want to talk bad about her, he says. But from this interview, Elisa sounds like a suicidal, cheating, sex maniac that gets blackout drunk and leaves her car around town. But for some reason, Brad asks for her forgiveness. Can't go a day or two, specifically their wedding day, without seeing these friends of his that he considered to be a bad situation only days before. And despite that, he made a promise to her when he got married and insists that the stories he does have about her being suicidal weren't something she would ever actually act on. He also paints Sharon out to be dating a meth head and abandoning her children at home while everyone goes out to party and thinks Elisa calls in a lesbian booty call after they're fighting at 2.30 in the morning over what appears to be his sobriety. Despite the fact the woman was apparently leaving the home with one of Sharon's children. A large gap in understanding happens once again related to the ending of their argument. And with five confirmed people in the house and possibly more, we have no witnesses to Elisa even coming back inside after the cops are called. Then Brad concludes he doesn't want to talk bad about her because he loves her. What do you guys think about all that? That just, just based on this whole interview, it, he was so hard on her, just like you just went through. You just led through the whole thing. So it seems really like it's one of those things when when you put the but. Anytime somebody says a statement, then you say but, everything before that isn't reality. Yeah. So. And I almost feel like this is, you know, how when a, a woman is testifying against somebody that sexually assaulted her on the stand and they call in to question her sexual history and, mm. and they try and make her look like the the perpet the bad person, the villain. Um, and, and it's like she's on trial. It almost seems like Elisa is, yeah you know, everything's being called out about her. It's not me. Don't look at me. I didn't do anything. It's not nothing to do with my past. Uh, I'm all good here. But she's got all this baggage, you know, and, and that's unfortunate. Yeah, her character is being assassinated by him within yeah. hours of them going yeah. through this wedding. Not to mention the fact that let's talk about the reality of what their relationship was. This dude moves into her place, doesn't have a job. So what's he really contributing is helping her with dog walking and dog sitting, basically driving her car around. Uh, we know that it was her credit card that paid for the drinks that night. Who do you think paid for any of the fees in terms of the marriage and all that? I mean, this guy is literally living on her dime and complaining about her like this on the day that she supposedly ends her own life. Like, I just... It's almost like he's making a case of why he killed her. I mean, it's really strange. It's like he puts out all these things like, oh, God, she's like this. She's like that. She's like this. She's unreasonable. She does this, this, and that. And, uh, but uh, then she killed herself. Right. right. It's really bizarre. And, 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 and not just that, but he goes from, in, in the other earlier mentions of suicide, he's like, oh, yeah, I, I, she just wanted attention. She wasn't going to do it. I, I could tell she didn't mean it. And then in the final one, when the blank, when the, detective looked at him and said did you have anything to do with it he's like i have no doubt that she killed herself right um so i have no doubt that she did this to herself um so he suddenly turns on a dime from not believing her previous suicide attempts uh that he mentions but all of a sudden this one is uh undoubtedly at, at her own hands yeah um i think it's really hard to even remain objective <laughs> with this type of interview like this. It just, it tugs at me emotionally. Like I feel angry even just listening to it. Um, and that's part of the reason why we wanted to release it in the way that we did. We wanted to try to get you guys a lot of other information before you heard this part. Cause I, I think it's going to be tough for a lot of people out there to listen to this and say, wait, you know, maybe, maybe this guy's actually telling the truth. Well, if he is, this is one tactless dude that really, <laughs> is probably not the best type of guy that you'd want around your life. And and I want to I want to personally be fair and balanced with him and 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 the questions, his mannerisms, his the way he was answering seemed I got the sense that he seemed sincere. Um it it sounded like he was answering cooperating um but then there's these little interjections of things in there that just sort of go against that. Um, so, 
again, I'm not a, a, an expert on how somebody talks and answers questions, but we, we've got the thing with the nervous laughs at times uh, during the conversation, too. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to, to really get into his psyche of, of what he's thinking and, and uh, what he's feeling. Yeah. Gray, any final thoughts on this? I was just still just thinking about just all the bashing he was doing, even though it's sort of worded in a way that, you know, it's not violently said or anything. It's just all these different things. And then you, she ends up dying. Uh, when you, It just seems like when you put everything together in the interview, it just seems like something's not quite adding up in there, to be I, honest with you. I would have loved for there to be a question and um, I think they should make this a standard question for death investigations like this. I think they should have asked him, do you have a past of domestic violence? Yeah. yeah. And they should find that out for the him for themselves yeah. and not even rely on, on him to answer. Just, but if you um, knew that going into this, like maybe you don't have time to run that search before you're interviewing him, you know, hours within her body, within her body being found. But if he, if you ask that early in the interview and you know, Oh yeah, he's actually got some charges around this. Maybe that would change the line of questioning a little bit. Yeah. And, and and going back to the interview overall, if 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 it was my wife that died under these circumstances that morning, I don't know if I'd be able to get through that entire interview without breaking down or without asking to take a break. Um, yeah, I, I he went through it like it was a. Uh, a walk in the park. Well, I, I know uh, many times in there he referred to what a burden it is on him that he has to be there and answering these questions. Do you guys ask everybody these type of questions? Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, on the previous segment and the part where he says, uh, uh, this sucks for her. But really, right before that, he said, this sucks. And then he brought it back. Oh, wait, and, and for her, too. See, yeah. so a lot of this stuff is about um how this is affecting him and how inconvenient it is and he doesn't really talk much about god i can't believe i lost my wife man yeah did we hear any statement like that no. in this whole interview uh, yeah and and I, I i don't think you hear that at all i you know and it's you know they say that you can't tell you can't come to conclusions just based on how somebody handles grief because everybody handles it there's that argument. Everybody handles it differently. Yeah. Um, but just to not have a lick of a tear, uh, you know, I just, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't, I don't think I personally could get through there without some kind of, uh, some kind of effects or, or reactions. We've all dealt with family members um, that have lost someone. We've, we've personally worked with people like that. If anything, I typically see a trend where the person that was lost is shown in maybe a better light than they might have been. Like sometimes you even lose the reality of it being a real person because they're so good and they were so perfect and they were so awesome all the time. I've never, ever seen it go this way where you have someone literally knocking that person down specifically on the day of their death. I just, it's, it's mind blowing. Uh, if you are struggling with thoughts of ending your own life, please don't hesitate. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. It's there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, please join us on the final live stream on Wednesday, April 8th at 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern on my channel, Gray Hughes Investigates. Make sure you hit the the notification bell, and all videos. You can find out more about the show at www.3meninamystery.com, and that's with the number three. And if you have any feedback, corrections, or new details, please send them to us via email at 3men at 3meninamystery.com, again with the number threes. Or you can reach out to us on Twitter at 3 men in a mystery. You can also find us on Facebook. 3 Men in a Mystery is produced by John Lorden, Mike Morford, and Gray Hughes. Please rate us on the podcasting platform that you found us on. 
and help us grow by telling your friends and family about us. On the next episode, we're going to continue learning about Brad by diving into his criminal history with previous Three Men guest, criminal behaviorist Sarah Kalin. Please join us here again in two weeks. I'm John Lorden. I'm Mike Morford. And I'm Gray Hughes. And we are Three Men and a Mystery.